r slash ask reddit what fan theory do you 100% accept as true kevin from the office was only pretending to be an idiot so that people wouldn't suspect that he was laundering money also ed truck wasn't decapitated creed made that shit up on the spot and nobody questioned it for some bizarre reason considering creed makes shit up all the time I've always assumed Creed heard Ed Truck died and those words jumbled around in his beautiful brain until head. Truck. Ed Truck was decapitated by a truck. Decapitated. Whole big thing. We had a funeral for a bird. Andy's parents are in the middle of a divorce when the first Toy Story is taking place. The dad is definitely divorced or dead. The movie takes place as Andy's mom is moving to her smaller house and Andy finds replacement father figures in two toys that represent traditional male archetypes. Also, the entire conflict between Buzz and Woody plays out like a dad and stepdad fighting over custody of a child. Also, the entire conflict between Buzz and Woody plays out like a dad and stepdad fighting over custody of a child. Mind. Blown. Disney made a movie called Frozen so that will now be the first thing that comes up when you google Disney Frozen and not Walt's head in a freezer. Also explained Disney on ice. Holy crap now I'm woke to the truth. Anakin accidentally used the force to make Padme fall in love with him. The romance element definitely looked stilted and forced in that movie. You're tearing me apart Padme. That none of the monsters in Courage. The cowardly dog were real. They were just Courage's imagination since he's, you know, a dog. He lives in the middle of nowhere because he doesn't know anything beyond the house he lives in. Every visitor or passerby manifests as an evil monster because his dog brain sees them as a threat. Eustace and Muriel are caricatures of the real people who own Courage. Muriel isn't that sweet and Eustace isn't that mean. And that's why Satan is pictured as a cat. Che 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 che. The Dark Knight's Joker was a war veteran. Tell me more please. In The Dark Knight, the Joker has multiple lines that reference this. First off, his conversation with Harvey Dent in the hospital. A truck of soldiers. Blown up and no one bats an eye was one of the things he told Dent. This seems strange to say. Second thing, Joker knows about interrogation techniques. As Batman smacks his head on the table in the police station, he tells him that you never start with the head. The victim gets all fuzzy. Seems like Joker has had his fair share of interrogations. Maybe even as the interrogator himself. And lastly, Joker is proficient with lots of weapons. Using RPGs and machine guns. This is why some people people believe that this Joker has PTSD from his war services. And that's why he turned insane. The Dursleys were more evil because of living with a Horcrux. I like that one a lot too. But the one thing that gives me pause is the first chapter of the series where it shows Vernon going about his day. He seems to be as much of the person he was when Harry was grown, considering all those around him that were wearing robes to be maniacs and crazies. Definitely couldn't have improved their disposition, though. I always thought Petunia Dursley was a very well written character. Think of it this way, you're a kid and discover that your little sister is literally magic. She has special powers that you don't have and will never have. And while you have to carry on with your perfectly average, humdrum life and go to school to learn maths and geography, your sister gets to go on a magic train to magic school to learn how to fly on broomsticks and perform miracles. Petunia wants to be Lily. It's even in the books that she writes to Dumbledore as a child to try to convince him to let her attend Hogwarts. And when she's turned down, the only way she knows to deal with it is to try to convince herself and magical people are freaks and being normal is better. It makes perfect sense she'd marry someone like Vernon who mirrors her attitudes perfectly. And dotes on Dudley because he's completely and utterly average. Teen Titans Go is just Beast Boys fanfiction. Given how terribly Terra treats him in TTG, I'm really hoping not. Is Beast Boy secretly a masochist? That the Blair Witch Project was not supernatural and that the two guys brought the girl out to the forest to kill her. What about that scene when they're running from the tent in the middle of the night and the girl is like holy shit what the duck is that? Dut. It is assumed she sees the witch. The directors said they actually planned to show the witch there. But they missed it on the shot. Yeah, that probably disproves it but because it isn't in the shot. It could be that she was paranoid and thought she saw something. Maybe it's not the director's intent but it still works. 
Han Solo knows full well that a parsec is unit of distance. He speaks as if it's a unit of time in order to test his potential clients and know how to posture with them. If they call him out on it, he can use the superior navigation system explanation. The Falcon's computer, L337's navlogs, is the best at navigating dangerous space finding short hyperspace routes. And if they don't, then he knows that he can inexplicably quote a higher price without the client knowing any better. Either way, he knows more about to what he's transporting and he has two ways of raising his transport prices. The expanded universe explains it. It's not exactly alpha canon but it makes sort of sense. The Kessel Run is a part of space filled with black holes. A faster ship can fly closer to the black holes without getting sucked in. So it can take a more direct route and travel a shorter distance to get through the region. But yet, it's hand waving and retroactive continuity. The real reason is George Lucas didn't know what a parsec was. The solo movie explains it. And it's almost exactly the same explanation. Except it's a single black hole and a nebula rather than a black hole cluster. That event horizon is a documentary of when humans first discovered the warp. Where we're going we won't need eyes. Dot. We're leaving. Neo isn't the one in the matrix. It's actually Smith. Neo was born outside in the real world. Dies and is reborn at the end of the first movie. However, Agent Smith also died and was reborn within the Matrix. He refers to it in an epic monologue when he first encounters Neo in the second film. The one also has the power to rewrite the Matrix as he saw fit. Smith clearly displays this power once he is reborn. Something that Neo never does. Neo only ever bends the rules, but he doesn't make the kinds of alterations that Smith does. Smith also calls the Oracle Mom when they meet in the third film. There are a bunch of other nuances but I am at work and that's all I remember off the top of my head. One of the things that point towards this idea is the Oracle telling Neo he's not the one. She wasn't lying. She knew from the start it was Smith. But she says, maybe in another life though. And then Smith kills Neo. And Neo comes back to life as the one. When by and large left Earth, most humans were left behind. Oh, that's dark. What makes you think that's what happened? Edit CCU slash Kirch the first captain of the Axiom began service in 2105. By and large his president acknowledges that the Earth's ecosystem was irreparably damaged in a secret message sent to the fleet in 2110. While it is possible BNL intended to save all humans, it is logistically unlikely they built enough spaceships for 7 billion plus people. Instead, I believe that the Wallies, which were wholly inadequate to the task of managing Earth's waste, we know there were even larger, more robust models on the actual starships, were designed to distract Earth's population while the wealthiest humans escaped to space. But the truly troubling aspect of the story is that the Axiom was the only ship that made it back to Earth. No other ships landed. What happened to the other Starliners? It destroyed her. What they did, she was never right again. She wouldn't use magic, but she couldn't get rid of it. It turned her inward and drove her mad. It exploded out of her when she couldn't control it, and at times she was strange and dangerous. Comma and Obscurial is an unstable, uncontrollable dark force that busts out and attacks, and then vanishes. Yeah I think it's fair to say that one's not much of a stretch. Seems so. It would seem that her not being able to control her magic, her father getting into trouble and the whole issue of wizards hiding their identities during and after that time all point towards this. The Winchester brothers bad luck is due to all the mirrors they broke in the Bloody Mary episode. I like this. I have a theory about Sherlock's borderline obscenely tight clothing. Sherlock is an addict. What happens to her dicks when they go on binges? They tend to do nothing but consume their drug of choice at the expense of eating, drinking, or sleeping. Consequently, they lose a lot of weight very rapidly. So, here's my theory. Mycroft finds Sherlock after one of his binges. He gets his brother cleaned up and buys him some new clothing. Given the choice do you really think Sherlock would choose to dress himself almost exclusively in suits and button down shirts? This is a man who literally wore a bedsheet to Buckingham Palace. He doesn't care what his clothes look like, but Mycroft does. 
So Mycroft has custom shirts and suits tailored for Sherlock so that he at least looks presentable despite being nothing but skin and bones. I Sherlock recovers from his drug binge. And he starts to regain the weight that he lost. But as he gains the weight, does he buy himself new clothing that fits appropriately? No. Of course not. He just keeps wearing the clothes that Mycroft bought him without any regard for how they fit. As a result Sherlock Holmes is constantly wearing button down shirts that are curiously too tight for him. Yet are still perfectly long enough for his arms and legs. Cool theory and very believable but just thought I'd let you know you wrote Microsoft about midway through the second paragraph. Gave me a laugh I immediately imagined Bill Gates giving Sherlock Holmes clothes. Who dressed you? A massive, gangly nerd, actually. Whenever a FNAF theory gets popular Cawthon adds a detail to the next game that invalidates the theory. At this point, it is the only valid idea. R2-D2 is the hero and ultimate focus of Star Wars, and they chickened out of making Jar Jar a Sith Lord. My friend has a theory that Yoda is piloting R2-D2 from the inside. Anytime you see them together, Yoda's using the force. Also, my pet theory is that R2-D2 is always the one piloting the X-Wing. He just lets Luke think he's in control. Also, my pet theory is that R2-D2 is always the one piloting the X-Wing. He just lets Luke think he's in control. HTTPS colon slash slash media jiffy com media l 2 jdubo 0 l rochksk no jiffy jiff. The Joker's superpower is timing. I've always liked this one as well as the idea that Joker is aware of his status as a comic book character or at least the existence of other Jokers from other universes dimensions timelines. He's so confident Batman won't kill him because in 99. 999% of worlds he dosed. Ever. My favorite fan theory about the Joker, don't know where I heard it, is that he doesn't have any superpowers or ingenuity at all. He is just aware of the fact he's in a fictional universe. This drives him insane and he does these over the top schemes to try and break his fictional reality. His obsession with Batman is due to the fact that Batman is clearly the protagonist of this whole charade and he wants to tear him down by any means necessary. Not sure if this counts, but I think that Nick Carraway, the narrator in The Great Gatsby is gay. His relationship with Jordan seems very much like a lavender marriage, where two gay people would get together for appearances sake. Further, she is described as being physically very boyish and athletic. They never seem particularly into each other, either. Also, the scene after Nick and company get wasted with the crew in NYC. He seems to wake up with that one neighbor lady's husband. I think it's the neighbor of Tom's mistress's sister. There is also a theory that Gatsby was either black or Jewish. Personally, I lean toward him being Jewish. Whoa, you made it to the end? You're a ducking beast. I'll cut you a deal. Smash like and subscribe for more curated content bruh. It's free and that's a great price.